I am uh, absolutely delighted to be here uh, talking to you at the DevOps Enterprise Summit. Um, this truly feels like my tribe because I've spent a lot of my career in large enterprises and I've spent a lot of my career trying to move towards this thing that we now call DevOps. Um, uh, just a little bit of history. I've been a developer, I've been an architect, uh, I've been a consultant. Uh, I also made the move into operations in the early 2000s um, and discovered just how little I knew about operations when I made that move and uh, discovered how badly most of our software survived in production because uh, I was part of a company providing outsourced operations and guaranteeing SLAs for software we didn't write and sometimes didn't have the source code to. Uh, if that sounds like fun, uh, it actually can be sometimes, but uh, I got the opportunity to see hundreds of production failures and discover some patterns around them. And that's, that's what went into my book, Release It. It's about patterns of production failures and uh, patterns of solutions that you can apply to solve classes of those failures. I wanna tell you a story from that time. I would say it's a story of DevOps, but DevOps as a term didn't exist then. Um, this is a story of despair and hope. Um, we have the hero of the system, or hero of the story, my poor defenseless system. Um, uh, if this were a different kind of conference, I'd tell you about my poor defenseless system uh, being under assault from a ravaging horde of developers carrying the fearsome multi-tools, except for the brave sysadmin standing like Horatius at the Tiber. I'd talk to you about Chroot jails and how I wouldn't let them sudo. Um, but we're not at that kind of a conference. Um, uh, instead of that kind of a conference, the kind of story we have is more like a medical mystery. There is a victim. Uh, there is a patient that we need to save, and nothing makes sense until the last 10 minutes after the final commercial break, and then we can solve everything. Uh, the patient in this case was the website. Uh, the victim in our drama was the bags of money, not the system. Uh, we were heading into a holiday season, and our projections looked like we needed about $10 million of new hardware to make it through the holiday season. And that's assuming that all of our uh, throughput scaled linearly. Um, well, when you start diagnosing a problem, you usually start with a connection diagram, something like this. Um, this is maybe a little bit of an abstraction. There's some details left out here. Um, <laughs> we draw a connection as this uh, arrow between boxes, but uh, if you actually started getting closer to the wiring, you'd see things that didn't even appear in the previous one. Uh, between the head and tail of that arrow, there's this whole other box, actually two whole other boxes, and there's another thing off to the side. What I observed in the run-up to this holiday season was very high I.O. on the back-end monitoring switch, the one that didn't even appear on the original diagram. So we have our, uh, uh, our hosts running the apps. They don't actually look like this. They look more like this. Um, and what we're dealing with here is, you know, something on one of these network ports is overactive. Well, it's a medical drama. So when you're in a medical drama and you don't know what to do, you biopsy something, um, pretty much anything. And a biopsy for us looks like, you know, a packet trace. So here's the packet trace, I'm looking at it, and I see tons and tons of TCP connections from all of the app hosts to all of the other app hosts. Now they're going through a monitoring switch and they're not supposed to do that. That's a little bit weird by itself. But I'm also seeing that it's a lot of setups and teardowns and only one packet being exchanged on every connection. So we have this backend interface being uh, hyperactive. We have about 100 app instances and each one is opening up 99 connections, closing 99 connections. Um, turns out after some tracing and, and some, uh, uh, shall we say, unauthorized code decompilation, uh, I uncovered the problem, which was that products being displayed on the main page were having a transient attribute touched, uh, just like a blast display time. That attribute was not supposed to be written through to the database, because you know, why do you update your product catalog when you're displaying it? But it was causing cache invalidation notices. So any time a product was displayed on any app instance, it was being knocked out of cache of every other app instance. It's not much of a cache when a thing can only be in one of them at a time. 
So basically, we were doing this. I found the problem. I wasn't really in a position to fix it, but I could talk directly to a friend of mine in development who knew how to get things through the system. Um, so we got a change request in. We bypassed a little bit of process, and we got it done. He implemented the fix and started getting it passed through the release process while I started the change control process. Great collaboration, perfect example of dev and ops working together. Yeah, except we kind of violated all the rules and broke the system a little bit. Um, this worked because we could meet at a concrete language. We both understood e enough of each other's realm to be able to communicate effectively. So we had abstractions in common. We could talk about the machines, the files, the sockets, the ports. I didn't need to talk about ITIL processes or SAN, LUN remapping. Um, he didn't need to talk about ESB transformations or any of that stuff. Uh, and so we were able to have this very rapid dialogue and get some fast feedback going. That fix probably has the best return per byte of any fix I've ever made, because we changed the word true to false and saved the company $10 million that year. Not bad. Kind of thing makes you wish you worked on commission. So we had fast feedback going. And fast feedback is, is a value that I think we all share here. But I need to sound a little bit of a note of caution. So I've listened to many of you talk about your stories of transformation in your companies. I've been consulting with a lot of companies that are transforming as well. And these things will sound like they're way off on the horizon but I'm telling you what to expect next year or the year after. Because feedback can actually start to cause problems. In fact, in systems, if your feedback gets too fast, you can generate noise. In aviation, there's this thing called pilot-induced oscillation. Um, that's where your aircraft starts to nose up, so the pilot pushes the stick forward, it starts to nose down, the pilot overcorrects, pulling back, and you get this porpoising motion. Uh, that's pretty hard on the equipment and really bad on any passengers that are up and about, say, going to the lavatory. This is the type of thing that happens when your controls are changing slower than your feedback cycle. Your feedback is coming around faster, you're starting to feel the movement, you change your control, and there's some inertia in the system. It takes a little while for that thing you've done to propagate through and actually affect the variable that you were observing. And so you can get noise amplification in electrical circuits. Um, this will happen with op amps that aren't damped. Um, and uh, it, it can cause a lot of uh, wasted energy and even damage. So since we're talking about aircraft, uh, I'm going to reveal or uh, share with you that I grew up around the Air Force. I was an Air Force brat. And uh, a lot of what I've learned comes from studying other disciplines, including the military. There's this concept in the military called maneuverability. Um, maneuverability doesn't just mean um, sort of being quick on your toes and being able to uh, uh, pivot rapidly. It comes from a guy named John Boyd, who was a fighter pilot and air combat instructor, and later in his career became a military theorist. Um, Boyd was a difficult person to like. He was confrontational. He loved to win an argument, um, unlike every other jet fighter pilot you've ever known. Um, one of the things he did was he created the first manual of air combat maneuvers and actually taught this. So here was a set of practices that pilots had been sharing and doing, but no one had ever written them down and, and actually called them a discipline. So here's an example of uh, a maneuver. Uh, our our uh, uh, protagonist here is the plane that goes up and comes back down versus the other one that's taking a wide bank. The idea is to get inside the opponent's turn radius so you can get them in front of you and get a firing solution. This maneuver consists of two parts. There's one part where you're exchanging kinetic energy for potential energy, uh, and then there's the part where you uh, change the potential energy back into kinetic energy. So as the plane is coming up, it's going to slow down quite a bit. It's that slowing and redirecting of the attitude that allows you to get inside the opponent's turn radius and get a solution on them. Boyd called this energy maneuverability theory. Uh, he actually kind of taught himself an aerospace engineering degree 
to be able to work out the mathematics around this and was able to, uh, to find um, that the key things in this are how fast you can change, exchange kinetic and potential energy, um, how quickly you can gain and shed momentum, and how rapidly you can change maneuvers. Now, I find this very interesting because we talk a lot about velocity. Velocity, of course, is a speed and a vector, but we don't talk about acceleration in the sense of changing which direction our velocity is going. And that's really going to be a key component, especially as we atomize our teams and atomize our software. Following through on Boyd's story a little bit, um, he actually stole a bunch of computer time at Eglin Air Force Base, near where I live now, uh, to run all of his calculations. He compared every aircraft in the US military with every aircraft in the Soviet military and found that they were all uh, pretty much inferior to the Soviet aircraft and would lose fights because at every altitude and at every airspeed, the Soviet planes could gain and shed momentum and redirect their, uh, their attitude faster. Um, pictured here is the uh, FB-111, uh, at that time the proud new aircraft of the US inventory. This was the darling of the Pentagon and the darling of Congress because parts were made in every congressional district. This was supposed to be a fighter. It turned out to be a bad fighter, so they relabeled it as a fighter bomber. Uh, it was a bomber that carried two bombs. Boyd put up a graph in front of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that showed a sea of red with one tiny little dot of blue. That tiny dot was the one combination of airspeed and, and altitude where the FB-111 could win in a dogfight. Um, didn't make him any friends. But Boyd and a few others uh, kind of did their own grassroots underground movement. Uh, he was assigned in the Pentagon and formed kind of a coalition of people that became called the Fighter Mafia. Uh, one of their projects was this aircraft, the F-16, um, one of the most successful fighter aircraft in human history. Relatively small, uh, relatively lightweight. It actually has more thrust than the weight of the aircraft. So you can sit it on its tail and accelerate upward, um, which to me kind of sounds like a rocket, not an aircraft. But there's a couple of counterintuitive things about it. For one thing, it has very high drag. Um, the short little stubby wings generate a lot of drag, and we think of drag as a bad thing. Drag is wasted energy, right? But if you're trying to lose speed, drag helps. And so in a dogfight, this aircraft can accelerate rapidly, it can slow down rapidly, and because it's kind of unstable, uh, you can repoint it. And sometimes you even repoint it the direction you want to go. This aircraft flies at the edge of instability. Well, Boyd took this EM theory and developed it further into maneuver warfare, uh, bringing in ideas that say uh, to defeat your enemy, you do it by uh, generating fear, uncertainty, and surprise to demoralize the enemy and dislocate them from their centers of gravity. Uh, distilled, the principles say, I should control the tempo of the engagements, I should take the initiative, and I should send ambiguous signals. So it's unclear what my ultimate objective is. Um, Boyd also did this thing called the OODA loop. Some of you will have been exposed to that. Uh, we are not going to need it today, so it's the last you'll see of this. Um, a lot of what we're talking about with this idea of being on the edge of instability is what you get in complex systems that reach a sort of self-organized criticality. Um, and I, uh, I contend that our enterprises are, in fact, complex systems. Uh, specifically complex adaptive systems, and they will tend to push themselves to the edge of instability. They'll create this self-organized criticality. Now, mathematicians have analyzed this in, in great detail uh, with things like avalanche models, catastrophe manifolds, earthquake distributions, and other very reassuring ideas. Um, these are all examples of nonlinear phenomena that occur in organizations as well as uh, dynamical systems. Um, but they're kind of undirected. Uh, you don't get to bias them towards a positive outcome. So what we need to do, though, is find a way to take our systems and organize them to create nonlinear responses in the direction that we like. And this is where we can come back to maneuver warfare and find some lessons from it. So 
a brief capsule description of maneuver warfare. The old thinking in warfare, going back to Clausewitz and others, was that you win by having superior forces, more material and manpower, and simply destroying the enemy's ability to, uh, to conduct battle, and then you can just you know, roll over them. This is the war of attrition, um, and it's what gave us things like trench warfare in World War I, and uh, uh, became exceedingly costly. The idea of maneuver warfare is to say, um, instead of committing to an objective early and digging in trenches, we're going to see where progress can be made. This is actually an older idea of warfare. It's, you know, uh, be strong where your enemy is weak. Um, so find where you get a bit of an advance, push harder there, and enlist or pull other forces in to help you. I'll contend that this is the opposite approach of typical uh, corporate IT management. If you have a failing project, you tend to put more resources into it. If you have projects that are successful, you tend to drain people away from them and reassign them elsewhere. Um, what we should be doing is probably more like this, where we try and you know, take the successful projects and let them draw in more resources and further capitalize on that success. Now, in order for this to work, um, we have to have the ability to change directions. So this is the maneuver part. We need to be able to gain or shed momentum. We need to be able to redirect where we're going. Um, we can do this in our work by applying these ideas of disposability, disposable infrastructure. By the way, I don't like the term immutable infrastructure. I much prefer disposable infrastructure because it gets more at what I want out of it. I want to be able to destroy and recreate these things as often as I need. I also like the idea of disposable code. Um, I think code is inventory, not an asset. Uh, you should make it so that you can delete any piece of your code and recreate it as cheaply as possible. Um, dependencies definitely need to be disposable. Dependencies in code and between teams are the number one thing that will slow you down. Um, I'll say maybe even the teams need to be disposable. That doesn't mean lay people off, but it means be able to say this service is no longer serving its purpose, so we're going to shut it down and reassign the people. Or we're even going to take that team as a unit that's already functioning as a unit and give them something else to work on. Okay, so reminder, we're going to set the tempo, obscure our ultimate objective, defer commitment, and so let's talk about tempo. You've probably encountered tempo in this sort of a notion, uh, the steady ticking of the clock, the, the clunk of the metronome. Uh, this idea of tempo comes from talked time in lean, but it doesn't work all that often in the work that I do because talk time really requires standardized work, which we rarely have. The other notion of tempo is, uh, again, coming from the sort of military arena, uh, tempo is how rapidly you can engage, disengage, move somewhere else. Um, if you take an experienced combat unit with a convoy of, say, 200 trucks to come in and set up a, an encampment, they can set up in one hour. They can tear down the next day in one hour and continue moving. An inexperienced or green unit will take six hours to set up camp and six hours to tear down camp that doesn't leave you very much time to actually get farther down the road. So there is benefit to the experience of doing this and having done it many times. It comes from 10,000 small decisions and small pieces of knowledge. How to pull the trucks in so that you can pull them all out in order instead of having to shuffle around. Pulling them in with enough spacing so you can get in and out and load and unload gear. Um, knowing where to set up tents. There are safety issues involved, too. Um, a unit that has experience will have less accidents and injuries. Um, one of the sadly common things was when a soldier would set up a, uh, his sleeping bag uh, someplace that the trucks would drive over the next morning. People will joke about the right way, the wrong way, the army way, but it turns out knowing where to find the mess hall, where to find the latrines, knowing where not to walk because it's a microwave line of sight beam, um, these all help you achieve higher tempo. In our world, this means there are common skills that people need to know how to do. So you know how to use version control, but you still need to learn how to use this team's version control or this organization's version control. 
You know how a build pipeline works, but do you know the differences between Jenkins and Spinnaker? It matters when you make that switch. Well, this is a force that kind of pushes against the idea of every team for themselves, every team does their own thing, because there can be some efficiencies that you gain from having people able to move fluidly and be effective. This doesn't mean you push back to one size fits all and everyone in the company is in our Perforce system. It means there is some granularity where the flexibility of a team picking their own tools meets the utility of people being able to move around. Okay, so after this talk, we're all gonna go back to our company and say, from now on, I set the tempo. Well, of course, it doesn't really work like that. Tempo is another emergent property. It's the result of your ability to maneuver. It comes from some characteristics of your organization and uh, really has to be built at every level. Something that we observe in the military context is what we call horizontal and vertical integrity. The idea is that uh, if I'm a small unit commander, I have a pretty good idea of how other small unit commanders near me are going to make decisions. I don't necessarily know exactly what decisions they're going to make, but I know how they will think about things because we've all been trained the same way. This is something that's actually really lacking right now because uh, as you go upward in the organization, you sort of pass through geologic strata, but in an inverted way, right? The higher you go, the older the skill set gets. So the methods of training, the assumptions, the ways of doing things um, are not uniform up and down. One of the characteristics that they talk about in maneuver warfare uh, is that everyone should share the same Fingerspitzengefühl, uh, which means fingertip feeling, and it's sort of an idea of instinctive actions given a context. So if you are presented with a particular production outage, and you wanna make sure it doesn't happen again, what's your go-to response? Hopefully here, you'll say the response is systemic. We need to increase safety in the build pipeline, we need to increase the resilience of the systems, but I guarantee there will be people in your organization whose response is process-based and about uh, instituting greater reviews. You do not share the same Fingerspitzengefühl. I practiced this word, so I have to use it enough times to make it worthwhile. Communication structures are another piece of uh, how you can get uh, flexibility out of these units. So imagine we have a structure like this, could be your service structure, could be your team structure, they're probably isomorphic, right? Um, so imagine that your comms kind of go like this, um, you know, something's going wrong, you need help, and you have to go up a chain to reach a sufficient level of management and then back down the other chain. Um, by the time you get help, it's gonna be way too late. So this would be the equivalent of you know, a, field in the, a, a unit in the field requesting close air support and having to go talk to the Pentagon to get an A-10 dispatch to come and provide close air support. Uh, by the time it gets there, you know, it's tomorrow and it doesn't matter. Or in our context, we finally get all our applications into Puppet, but the devs have moved on to Docker and we have to redo all that. A better version of communication is to have direct uh, uh, lateral communication during the events and then provide the after action review uh, later on after the, well, after the action has happened. The prerequisites for this are those ideas of common language uh, and definitely some trust and common priorities. One of the things that impeded this in the US military for years was something so stupid it's hard to believe but different branches of the service had procured different radios that couldn't communicate with each other. They used different frequency hopping uh, codes and algorithms. So you'd have you know, an Air Force unit and an Army unit that literally couldn't talk to each other. We wouldn't have anything like that, right? Like you know, one team in HipChat and another one in Slack? Hmm, okay. There are things we can do at the team scale We've spent a lot of time talking about this and looking at it, um, but there are also things we need to think about at the group scale. There are a couple of ideas from uh, domain-driven design that I think we can apply here. The notion of a bounded context and a ubiquitous language. So within the bounded context, we should all be speaking the same language. 
product teams help here. And then I'm going to add a notion called intent. And I'll come back to what that means in just a moment. Um, I think discoverability is hugely important. And I think temporary assignments across different groups or across different divisions also really help build that lateral trust uh, across your organization. OK, so um, intent is another idea that has uh, really taken up, um, been taken up in the militaries quite uh, thoroughly. The idea is when you give an order, you don't just say what is being done. You actually do explain why. This will come as a surprise to people whose idea of the military is still based on uh, World War II movies, but actually the command and control notion was broken down a long time ago, back in the 80s. These days, there are different variations in different branches of the service, but all of them have some notion of a complete order, including all of these ideas. So situation is, who are the friendly forces? Who are the enemy forces? Uh, what is the terrain like? Uh, are there civilian uh, structures in the area? The mission is who, what, where, when, and most importantly, why. The commander's intent always includes why. What is, it, what is the purpose of the action you're about to take? Execution has a lot of you know, military stuff in it. What's, what's the vulnerability? How are you going to exploit it? What's the desired end state? Um, what are the tasks? What's the coordination? Actually, none of that really sounds military, does it? That kind of sounds like how you execute on any strategy. Hmm. Uh, administration or sustainment, uh, the fun way that I heard that described is beans, bullets, and batteries. That's what you need to keep the, the uh, units operating. And then uh, command is your signal structure. Who is the decision maker? Who's the secondary if the decision maker can't respond? Uh, what is the command structure and what's the succession in the command structure? So this notion of intent is typically expressed as five paragraphs on one page or two pages. It's used at every level. So generals provide intent to colonels, colonels provide intent to captains and lieutenants and so on. The final idea I want to bring in very quickly is initiative. Now, initiative doesn't mean you're rolling to see who moves first. Um, initiative here comes more from the idea of go. Uh, there's this notion of sente in go, which is a move that demands a response. So when you have sente, you determine the rate of territory change. Uh, the inverse notion is gote, which means you must respond. So a couple of quick examples. When Amazon created AWS, they took Sente from all the hosting providers. I know I was working at one and jumping up and down trying to get them to listen. Um, when Uber went into Thailand, they undercut the tuk-tuks. And in Thailand, you don't mess with the tuk-tuks. Uh, the tuk-tuks and the cab drivers uh, convinced the government to ban Uber. So that was uh, them taking back Sente. It was, Uber was a move that they had to respond to, and they did pretty successfully. Um, contrary example, when Uber went into London, the black cab drivers protested by disrupting traffic and blocking people from getting to their jobs. This did not make people angry at Uber. It made them happier with Uber and mad at the cab drivers. So that was not recovering Sente. If you combine initiative and tempo, then you are taking the initiative, you're making moves that your opponents have to respond to, and you're actually going to accelerate away from your opponents. You're going to advance faster than they can catch up. And so this is how I think we can combine the emergent properties of tempo, maneuverability, and initiative so that in our autonomous teams, we can all be moving in a direction and accomplishing uh, right actions uh, as the easy path rather than trying to re-corral things and have the pendulum swing back to centralized control in another decade. So if you would like a copy of the slides, uh, please send an email to this address, mtnygard at zip.sh with the subject tempo. Uh, you'll get the slides and a few other bonus items. And I thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>